Hello and welcome to the Spike Podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and with me this week we have Spike's editor Tom Slater. Hello. And I'm delighted to welcome Mail Plus columnist Charlie Peters. Hey. Coming up on the show, the crisis in Ukraine, the never-ending Partygate scandal, trigger warnings on 1984 and the cancellation of Kate Clarkshee. So tensions have been rising in Ukraine this week. We've been hearing day in, day out that Russia is preparing for an invasion. At the time of recording, nothing that significant has happened. But certainly there has been a clear kind of escalation, um, definitely on this side, mm -hmm. Tom. What have you made of this week? I found the, the sabre rattling from Britain and various different Western powers, although there is a split amongst the Western powers that we might get into a little bit. Just incredibly dangerous and at times a little bit absurd as well, mm. to be honest with you. I mean, over the weekend, we had the, those revelations presented by the Foreign Office of this plot to kind of install a pro-Kremlin government in Kiev and all the rest of it, which completely unraveled on contact with reality. You know, yeah. you had kind of former Ukrainian officials point out that this was ridiculous, not least because five of these people were based in Russia. <laughs> you know, they were saying that if you wanted to impose this government, you'd have to do it by force, which yeah. of course... Um, Russia doesn't want to do. And I think that was an interesting case of, first of all, just how much, certainly Britain, but other countries as well, have invested in the idea that this is imminent, um, that Russia is this expansionist, almost imperial power that needs to be faced off. But then on the other side, whilst you do definitely have a rising of tensions and all the rest of it, if you um, look at even just the kind of English, Moscow or Kiev-based journalists, that drumbeat towards conflict is not there to the same degree whatsoever, um, which I think just tells us something about how much this kind of saber rattling at this point is is really something which the the west is particularly preoccupied with with doing it gets something out of it but this government obviously will do anything to give itself some semblance of purpose <laughs> in the midst of <laughs> ridiculous discussions about cake and all the rest of it but it's just been that thing that we've seen for many years now which is just how much the west kind of needs to posture against russia even when it risks inflaming tensions more in a quite tricky situation. Yeah, I found one thing that really illustrates what you're talking about is this figure of 100,000 troops mm. on uh, Russian troops on the Ukrainian border. We've been hearing that figure bandied around, around since last April, essentially. It goes up and down it sometimes. Go, yeah, yeah. It's, it's been higher than it is mm -hmm. now, apparently at the height of the, of the tensions. And, you know, many Ukrainians have said, actually, what's changed in the last five years, let alone mm -hmm. the last year. I mean, Charlie, um, we should talk a bit about the UK and its response. I mean, there is this saber rattling, as mm -hmm. as Tom has alluded to. There are, you know, some voices who are really gung ho in stirring up tensions. What have you made of that? Uh, well, it's the, the same old, usual suspects, I suppose. <laughs> the same people who were calling for us to send uh, an aircraft carrier to landlocked Afghanistan in se in <laughs> September last year, <laughs> and now calling for a, an open ground war with Russia, which um, um, for a few army reservists like myself has involved quite a lot of nervous googling. <laughs> 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 you join you join as a part time soldier for a bit of extra money, and before you know it, it's a Google Maps and a bit of crisis time. So um, not good, long and short. I think mm. for a lot of these people, it's bruised egos, driving saber rattling conversation. Um, some of those MPs that I you know, would mention, Tobias Elwood and Tom Tugendhat, who's, you know, have been decimated in their foreign policy ambitions over the last year and what they want the UK to do, what the kind of country they want the UK to be around the world. And then they now look towards what's happening in Ukraine and say, aha, here's a chance for us to finally mm. reassert that control, that confidence, that purpose that, mm. that Tom alludes to. But it won't come because the British Army is seven blokes and a packet of quavers, <laughs> and a hundred thousand troops that may or may not be encroaching on Ukraine is not something that we could match. And I don't think it will happen. Yeah, I mean, a couple of months ago, I I said I think now rather stupidly that I was confident that a war in Ukraine was highly likely. Um, I now think that probably a minor incursion, like a, something quiet and and dodgy and, and, and nifty from Putin is likely. A fallout blown war is not something we want. And I don't think it's something that he wants either. So yeah. I hope the saber rattling dies down. Uh, talking about what Putin wants, I mean, there seems to be a, an attempt to almost psychologize mm. him. You know, when every Western kind of representation of Putin is this this madman, this crazed puppeteer. He's always shown with a globe, sometimes with like swirly eyes. Mm -hmm. But isn't it actually quite clear what Russia wants, which is just not for NATO to not to keep expanding towards its borders. No, exactly. It's been so clear for so <laughs> such a long time. There's so much kind of Kremlinology. There's so much kind of, you know, psychologizing of, of Putin. Basically anything to make him look mad, really. Mm -hmm. um, or he's either mad or he's a kind of master chess player. They can't really work yeah. out which it is a lot of the time. But, you know, this the idea he wants to recreate, if not the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire, all this kind of stuff. 
it's been clear both in their demands and for many, many, many years now that the issue is the eastward expansion of NATO. And in particular, um, Ukraine, What it seems like their primary um, objective is to keep Ukraine something resembling neutral. Mm-hmm. Um, now, obviously, people talk about the um, seizure of Crimea and the ongoing conflict in East Ukraine and all the rest of it um, and 2014. But at the same time, I think there's just this failure to recognise that in a lot of matters, Russia is quite kind of defensive and reactive. You know, the pro-Russian Ukrainian government gets overthrown quite violently with the kind of thumbs up, really, of a lot of Western officials. Things really descend into a lot of um, chaos. And then you seize, again, Crimea because it's what allows you to have that port and that naval base. I mean, it's uh, you don't necessarily have to support that <laughs> Vladimir Putin's government to recognise the kind of logic of what it is he's doing yeah. um, and the reasons for it. And then also recognise on the other side that the constant expansion of NATO, therefore, is a provocation. Mm. Um, but there's a, a refusal to even accept that's the case. Um, but as you say, despite all of these kind of quite sort of high highfalutin theories as to what it is he's actually trying to achieve, trying to get inside his head, if you just listen to what they're actually saying, it's pretty clear and it has been for a long time and yet the West continues to just kind of push those buttons time and again, if you like. One thing that feels new about this conflict is um, a kind of split in the West. Um, Certainly the UK and the US feel very, you know, gung-ho in opposing Russia. Boris even wants to paint himself as the head of this anti-Russian alliance. But Germany's not playing ball. France is on the fence as well. I mean, what have you made of that kind of split? I'm not entirely sure why there is that split, although there seems to be um, an insistence from some commentators, which I find quite convincing, that the reason why Germany is not looking that way is because they are completely at the mercy of Russia for energy supplies. Mm -hmm. Um, They ignored for for decades the need for nuclear power. They rely very much on... um, you know, liquid, liquid natural gas from over the east. And now that a, a possible um, war with Ukraine is on the horizon, they don't want to make that situation even worse for themselves. So you have a cost of living crisis on, a, on another scale. Mm. <laughs> They're already facing something pretty drastic with energy prices, as are we here. And yeah. I think they don't want to make that even worse. And sending weapons to a front line in a war that may not take place is a very bad way of achieving that. It's been interesting as well, because since Brexit and Trump in particular, I think the kind of Russophobia of the political class has now become entirely bipartisan in particular, because they, you know, they blame Russia for those mm, two yeah, yeah, electoral yeah. events yeah. and all the rest of it. Any, and I, what I think is interesting is just how, it's, how important this kind of spectre of Russia is to them mm. kind of a, and on a kind of bipartisan basis, you know, it kind of, it's the desperation to cling on to a kind of refashioned version of kind of Cold War thinking in which obviously the Soviet Union was a genuine sort of, you know, competing mm. system of, of, of government and all the rest of it. Um, whereas now, you know, you're talking about a country that has an economy the size of Italy, yeah. you know what I mean? It's very uh, defensive, has lost a lot of territory over the course of recent decades. And yet you have this desperation, I think, because a lot of Western politicians don't really know what they're for, mm. to kind of just posture against it. It's so even that quite sort of deracinated we're for democracy and liberalism as opposed to this um, quite despotic government, uh, which often feels a bit insincere given in practice a lot of these people don't really give a shit about democratic (laughs) values. Or you've got this kind of new dynamic, particularly in the kind of 2010s onwards, where it's almost like a kind of globalised culture war. Russia is anti-LGBT, it's Mm -hmm. socially Mm -hmm. conservative, we're better than them because we're fine with pride marches. That kind of tends to be the decision. But it just seems to be, what's interesting about that, on on the one hand, it seems so... um, revealing about a kind of lack of purpose in the West that you feel the need to kind of posture against this um, this enemy, as it were. But at the same time, how just for the sake of getting your rocks off, you can continue to stir up genuine conflict, yeah. which will have real, could potentially have real consequences for real people's lives in countries that deep down you don't really care that much about these people. And that's what's so shocking, I think, about it. It's, it's, it's revealing, but it's also just so reckless at the same time, I guess. We at Spiked are always looking to learn new things that can help us improve our knowledge of the world around us. And that's why we love Wondrium. Wondrium is the place for everyone who's ever wondered about anything. We've been talking a lot about Russia on today's show, how it's become a Western bogeyman. If you want to go beyond the shallow caricature and learn more about the real Russia, I'd recommend checking out the Wondrium series, Understanding Russia, A Cultural History. It's presented by the professor Lynn Ann Hartnett, an expert in Russian history and culture. She leads you through 24 episodes looking at the reigns of Ivan the Terrible, Catherine the Great, the Romanovs, all the way through to modern day Russia under Putin. And it's not just about the politics. You'll learn loads about Russia's rich cultural history. Art, literature, music are all covered in depth as well. 
It's a must watch. Wondrium's vast curated library covers just about every subject you can think of. Science, history, music, language, travel, religion, health, business, and so much more. Each series features teachers, professors, and experts who will inspire you to keep on learning new things every day. Wondrium's programs are so easy to watch and listen to. I turn on Wondrium at home to watch it on my computer, and then I pick up where I left off using the Wondrium app on my phone on my journey to work. Wondrium really is the ideal learning companion. If you're curious about the world, I know you're going to love Wondrium. So check out Understanding Russia, A Cultural History, and then have a look at the thousands of other videos Wondrium has to offer. And right now, Spikes listeners get a special free 22-day trial offer to celebrate the new year. To get it, you need to sign up through our special URL, wondrium.com slash spiked. Again, that's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash spiked and start your learning journey today. One government that certainly doesn't seem to have any purpose is our own in the UK. I mean, it's lurching from scandal to scandal. This, the Partygate saga, I mean, it, it still hasn't ended. New revelations this week about a cake. One Tory MP saying Boris was ambushed with a cake at his birthday <laughs> party. <laughs> the police have now got involved. We're still waiting on the Sue Gray report. I mean, Boris is still clinging on. How has he managed that? Um, because he is the buttered up slippery piglet who always escapes <laughs> the butcher's knives and he will do so again. <laughs> He's running off that butcher's table forever. Um, also because there is this operation save big dog right thing going on <laughs> behind the scenes and there is like there are dozens of MPs who are, who are willing to jump in front of the bullets and, and mm. say or do anything to to keep the man who won in that massive majority yeah. in charge. Um, but I think I think he probably should go. Um, people are underestimating, I think, the level of discontent between um, what is being reported in the media and what people around the country actually feel. Um, this feeling of one rule for us, one rule for another, it's kind of cliche now to mention, but it does actually really matter. Yeah. And but politicians should have standards and, and leadership. And Boris Johnson has revealed himself as someone who clearly doesn't have very many. Um, and for Tories in particular, the longer they stay with him, the worse it will look for them. Because if they decide to jettison from Boris after the local elections further down in, was it May? Yeah. Um, they'll just say, oh, the only reason they got rid of him was because they started losing, not yeah. because of actual legitimate concerns about his integrity and his leadership capacity. So for this government to continue under a different ministry, they'll have to essentially get rid of him in the next month or so. And maybe the Sue Gray report will give them the ammunition to do that. But the police now getting involved mm. two years on retrospectively for some mad reason, that might take away some important information from the report that could be most damning to Boris Johnson because it might be kept under kind of a police requirement. So, I mean, who knows what happened next week? It seems the journalists don't know when the report's going to be released. Yeah. Um, so Might be out by the time people are watching this, yeah. but, but who knows? Yeah, Boris, if you're still around, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, what have you made of this week? I, I just quickly, I think it's funny how obviously all week journalists haven't really known what was going on, but that didn't stop them giving kind of hour by hour yeah, updates. 11 p.m. What... some guy last night and I was like, go to bed. It's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's a brilliant kind of example of how so much um, uh, journalism these days is just kind of reproducing briefings you've heard from someone else. Yeah, even if it has. Mate. Exactly. Yeah. That's it could be automated, surely, at this point. Sugar <laughs> report, still not, out, still, yeah. not out, still not out. Still not out. Still It's a really good advert, I think, for just like getting your news like maybe twice a day. Like, yeah. you know, just read a newspaper <laughs> in the morning, catch the yeah. six of the ten, just leave it at that. Because a lot of this kind of wittering is mm -hmm. literally just that. But anyway, uh, it's, it's <laughs> interesting because one thing that's, we've talked about this, you know, endlessly because it's just dominated everything. One thing that's kind of come out, which I have some sympathy with is people say, isn't it ridiculous that we're talking about getting rid of a prime minister because he attended a few parties. And on one level, I do understand that. Mm -hmm. um, and there has always been an element, whether it's with Boris Johnson and his uh, lying, frankly, or yeah, his, yeah, yeah. you know, lack of silly with the truth. There's whether it's any of his kind of previous kind of scandals, um, which he's up to now managed to kind of wriggle out over. And then of course the kind of COVID rule stuff, which has become very moralistic at times, often um, almost uh, over the top, you know, it becomes, yeah. a, it becomes a really borderline discussion about whether or not this work situation becomes a party because you introduce wine and cheese or whatever. But not only did the kind of Christmas party stuff, I think, breach into something else. And then the May um, drinks party, especially at the height of lockdown, yeah. made people feel like that was particularly unjust. But I think it's also at this point, there's just nothing else to 
sh- shout about with this yeah. government. They haven't got anything else to fall back on. You know, Brexit is done in quotation marks. Um, obviously, the, the vaccine rollout is, has been a success, but that's kind of behind him now. What else has he got? Yeah. You know, if, if he had anything else to talk about, then people's concerns about this being a Remainer plot and it's all politicised, I think would have probably a bit more weight to them. Yeah. But it's just, you're just left with the firefighting and the trying to get past this particular scandal. And then when you think about what this government has been doing, aside from COVID um, in over the course of the past couple of years, a lot of it's been dreadful. Yeah. You know, it's been embracing net zero. Yeah. It's been just sort of looking, trying to look both ways on the, the culture war, on a lot of issues that could give it a bit of energy again. Um, and one that would bring it very much in line with a lot of the voters who took a chance on it last time. They just can't really go for it. So obviously there's a lot of Remainer glee mm. at the downfall or the potential downfall of Boris Johnson. There's a lot of very devious people who hope this will serve as a hammer blow, not just to him, but to what he represents. You've got to be very cautious about that. You know, you don't want to put the wind at the sails of those people. But at the same time, what is there left to defend now? Yeah. You know? It's just this, it's just firefighting this scandal at this point. I mean, if you replace them with someone else, you're still going to get net zero and well, yeah, all, you know, all, <laughs> all that, all that what, other stuff. What is there there? Who, who, who will step in and, and, <laughs> and create a madness instead? No one. I mean, Richie Sunak would just be like, okay, we're going to carry on the same path of nothing. And mm. he doesn't look a man of radical vision to say the least. So yeah, it's a miserable situation. It is interesting though, just how they, they have got no clue the Tory party that is, yeah. what yeah. to do next. I mean, I think that's a large part of the reason why he hasn't gone yet, or at least there hasn't been an attempt to get rid of him yet, is because they're really unorganised. They've got no sense of what should come next. When you hear some of the conversation, it's, we need a proper conservative, by Mm. which they mean the sort of person who wouldn't have won, really. You know, know, we need to go back to some sort of Thatcherite Mm. agenda, just completely missing the fact that the reason Johnson won was because he didn't feel or look or sound like a like a usual Tory. We might sound like one, but you know, in terms of his yeah. policies and offer and all the rest of it. Sure. And so I think this is one of the things that just drags all of this out. I mean, obviously Labour will continue to be the sort of parasitic beneficiary of all this stuff. <laughs> um, but in terms of the Tory party in particular, I think it's just really fascinating because that the thing that made them a going concern again, that sort mm. of Brexit energy, it was very just a few people at the top of the party. A lot of them don't really get it. Yeah. Um, and I think their moves after Johnson are going to demonstrate that. I think also there's been an issue with them in a very similar way to kind of Remainers taking over Mm. the mantle when May took over. They misunderstood their own voters. Mm. May thought, you know, crush the saboteurs, that kind of energy, (laughs) right? That whole, we need to destroy the opposition. And, and, you know, she wasn't a Brexiteer. She Mm. didn't know who she was representing. I think there's a similar problem with this ministry. They don't know what their voters want. Mm. And so they are fanning around with plastic bags and and seals (laughs) instead of of like the cost of living, housing, real Mm. wages. Nobody, Mm. Nobody in the government seems to care about making people who voted for them richer, which is clearly the most like guiding principle you have if you're a voter. Mm. Yeah. And uh, one thing the government has done well, but doesn't seem to be able to shout about is on the day we're recording this, pretty much all of the COVID restrictions have gone, you know, Freedom Day 2.0. Yeah, they just haven't been able to make a virtue of it, Tom. What's that all about? Well, obviously, you know, for a lot of the reasons we've been talking about, it's probably (laughs) the primary thing. But there's also... uh, Johnson's started to do this now a little bit more, but he's never been able, as you say, to kind of like make a virtue out of this to say why well, it's a good thing that these mm. restrictions are going mm. because of the fact that just the weight of, if not public opinion, and certainly what it's kind of acceptable to say in polite society is that it's it's still the high status opinion to be pro-restrictions in some yeah. way, shape or form. Even though everyone knows the game is kind of up, yeah. you know, it's over. We've yeah. got to get on with things. There's still this sense at which you're a bit of a mad libertarian if you want that to happen. Mm-hmm. So it's just difficult because, you know, it's, it's something that which throughout this, he's never been able to say we're opening up and that's a good thing because, yeah. again, the response you get. But the fact that even now he can't do that is fascinating because it's the safest point at which he could possibly embrace this. I, I think he could, but again, he's misunderstanding his own voters. He thinks that the people he needs to appeal to are those, you know, you say the high status um, professional <laughs> workers yeah. who obviously love him so much, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Those people <laughs> are... Get them, right? <laughs> those, bar- those people are kind of the rebranded, reheated FBPE, whatever they're calling themselves this week crowd, mm. right? The Uber Twitter remainers. Mm. Double maskers. Why does he need, why does he feel the need to appeal to those people when clearly they'll never give him an inch? You know, they'll never care for him. Let's talk about a story that seems to have essentially broken satire, I think it's Mm. fair to say. Uh, 1984 is the world's most famous dystopian novel about the dangers of censorship. And the University of Northampton has slapped a trigger warning on it, warning students that it it contains explicit content and scenes they might find upsetting (laughs) and offensive. True. (laughs) Tom, what have you made of this? 
It's I, I'm still not convinced someone didn't make this up. You know, I'm, wait, I'm <laughs> well, waiting for it to turn out that someone's got, just got a bit carried away um, at some news, online news desk. But no, it seems to be the case. Um, it shows that there's no sense of irony, probably no uh, general, uh, you know, depth of understanding of literature amongst some of these people. I think one of the things that's interesting about it is that trigger warnings used to be really presented by their defenders as this is basically almost like a therapeutic psychological type intervention. Yeah. It's about people who might have experienced sexual assault, extreme mm. racist experiences. You don't want to trigger that trauma and therefore you put this trigger warning on it. This is just parental advisory stickers <laughs> now. Like there's no, you know, there's no kind of yeah. alternative to that. And it, I, but what I think it it's, uh, reveals is that it has kind of always been that in mm. one way, shape or form. Firstly, because any of the sort of literature on whether or not these things were actually effective, people who are genuinely sort of traumatised, uh, was always suggesting that if anything, probably made matters worse. Yeah. Um, but also because they've always just served that function of saying, of problematising a book, you know, of presenting it as something dangerous. It's not to say that I think, you know, the University of Northampton bureaucrats who've done this necessarily think that 1984 is a, is a terrible, evil, problematic novel, yeah. but they just have such a degraded view of individuals that they th that they think everything's kind of potentially upsetting and problematic, really. So, yeah, it's just it's it's just a reflection, I think, of in what such low esteem that kind of students are held, I guess, and people in general that they feel the need to even where this book is concerned, <laughs> without any shred of irony, slap a warning on one of these things. I mean, Charlie, isn't this the book that all woke students should read and maybe have a glimmer of self-realisation well, as they flip through the pages? Well, right, exactly. And as Brendan said in his, his column for Spiked on this, you know, lots of people bought 1984 after Trump was elected, <laughs> yeah. thinking yeah. this will explain the evil man who's in charge. Got a few pages in and thought, oh, crap. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> Who do I think I am? But I mean, like, every now and again, I see a story in the news and I think, well, this will make Fraser and Tom's day. Yeah. But this one, I think, might actually cause Spike to fold. It's so like on the nose. It's so <laughs> Where can beyond. we go from here? Yeah, no, what's, yeah, exactly. left, uh, what's left after this? Peak um, work. What is, uh, you know, quite concerning about this, beyond the kind of insanity and the obvious kind of satirical element of it, is that I don't know if it was asked for by students. In fact, yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm convinced it wasn't. I mean, Tom, you rightly note that this is the, a low view people are seeing students in. They, they see them as kind of shrieking fairies who mm. need to be protected from problematic content. But I don't know if any students requested this. Mm. And it's often the case that they don't. Yeah. And it is administrators and senior academics who are reacting against a, a market condition they think exists, but actually doesn't really. Yeah. And they put these things in place preemptively. They don't think... Um, Oh, maybe we'll let the students read this book and see what they think. They nervously panic and they think, let's go through this entire curriculum, see what covers any problematic themes and <laughs> trigger warning panic. Um, and this has clearly come up in that way. I think almost certainly that's what's happened here, yeah. as is often the case with these warnings. Yeah. And they haven't singled out 1984. You know, they mm. chose other books like, yeah, you know, of course. Um, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night Time. Definitely, definitely. I think reading they chose that. Jane Eyre as well, if I'm right. Bronte. Yeah, 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 they chose Charlotte Bronte. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's she ever done? Anyway. <laughs> and some of that, but that is the kind of cl the classic problem, isn't it? We've, mm -hmm. you know, we've talked about campus censorship for years and we have never argued. People might character, caricature mm. our argument as this, but we have Bashing never argued whatever, yeah. that we are against students, that mm. all students are, you know, snowflake, crybabies. Mm. Th that's never been the case. It's always been either a minority of students mm. or university administrators assuming that other students can't deal with it. Yeah, no, completely. That's, all, that's always definitely been the case. I think the difficulty is, is that for whatever reason, that... Um, conception of students as being really sort of just weak, really, in, in need of all of this sort of therapeutic, like scaffolding, isn't it? even as they go through their university life. It has just sort of won the day. I mean, mm. you would think that universities still had like in loco parentis responsibilities or whatever, the way mm. they treat students. Mm, right. But for all kinds of different kind of cultural and political reasons, that is sort of how young people are viewed. And they're invited to behave in that fashion as well. So even though, as you say, it's a minority, you then just have a lot of kind of political um, kudos given to people who will go around saying this book, this speaker, this whatever really upsets and unpersons me and, yeah. you know, um, all this sort of stuff. Because again, that is the view that rules on campus. So they'll give in to that kind of demand, therefore again, burnishing this idea that that's what students are like. And, and there are loads of fads, of course, that take place politically and the kind of the cycle that students will, will lap up and mm. reuse. But the one constant throughout all of that in the last well, best part of a decade has been mental health activism. That has been the one consistent concern that, is, yeah. that every mm -hmm. student generation has had in the last decade. And so you will always find this therapeutic language used to justify censorship, yeah. concern, a steadying of life. 
and actually um, the removal of stress mm. from life. And if that book makes you stressful, then it's got to go as well. I, mean, I remember my first year at Edinburgh, um, aromatherapy being offered on my second <laughs> week. Like I should like get sniffing salts for attending lectures or some madness. <laughs> and, and that's when I realized something really was quite awry. But you know, that that level of concern and that kind mm. of duty of care, mm. that kind of mentality will be at the heart of all of these concerns. Let's move on to another uh, literary scandal. Uh, Kate Clanchy, the Orwell Prize winning poet, was famously kind of cancelled uh, last year. Uh, quotes from one of her books, Kids I Taught mm. and What They Taught Me, uh, were taken out of context, you know, put all over the internet and she was maligned as a racist. Now, this week, her publishers have dropped her and taken all of her books out of circulation. I mean, this is more than a cancellation, mm. it's an obliteration, as one, of, uh, as Joanna Williams said on Spike this week. I mean, Charlie, I mean, Kate Clanchy is an extremely liberal person. It's hard mm. to find someone more painfully right on, and yet even her books are being cancelled. She's being unpersoned from the world of publishing. What do you make of that? People will always look to their own side for purity in all cases, and um, banishing someone from your team is a is a sign of you know a great commitment to the cause. So it's no real surprise often that you find even great liberal, honest, decent people being destroyed in this manner. Um, the quote that was used most most popularly online on Goodreads yeah. and Twitter mm -hmm. was describing an Asian child as having almond-like eyes, yeah. right? almond-shaped almond eyes. Shape, yeah. almond shape. What's so bad about that? I mean, what, yeah. what's been crazy is that the student herself said, I do have I do, yeah, yeah. That's in an yeah, interview with the Times. Loads yeah. of people responded saying, yes, yeah. sure, that's about right. You know, <laughs> sure. Um, and so, yeah, it's an entirely fake concern. And and similar, I think, to the student situation, it's a very small minority of people mm. acting in a way which causes a publisher to freak out. Yeah. Um, I don't know many people in publishing. Maybe that's why I've not had a book yet, but um, <laughs> those, that I, those that I do know tell me kind of on the download that so many of their morning meetings are like, what can we do to advance you know, anti-racism yeah. and this local concern or this cause that we've got this week? And someone pipes up and goes, what's this got to do about selling books? Yeah, That doesn't seem to be the main mentality occupying a lot of publishers mm. these days. They want to see themselves as uh, another arbiter of political activism. What was struck me about it was this book came out in 2019. Yeah. You know, there was this discussion that will often pop up about if a book is, you know, that you'll pulp some Dr. Seuss books or whatever for some racist cartoons yeah. in it, or even a book from 20, 30 years ago because some of the language is a bit fruity now or whatever. <laughs> this book was written two and a bit years ago or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, it's just the, the speed with which this is happening. It just shows you this is not about racism. Mm. I mean, as we were saying, the quotes itself, these, this, is a, this is a loving portrait of teaching a kind of inner city state comprehensive with a very mixed sort of intake. Mm. Um, and one of the, uh, actually the byproducts of this cancellation, of course, is that these poetry books that Kate Clancy would put together of yeah. her students are now going to be, be out of circulation, which yeah. I don't know who that's helping, but, um, it's not about anti-racism. It's just, it's racial hysteria. Yeah. Um, the fact that this happened after, you know, you know, in the wake of kind of 2020 and everything that went on there is what we're talking about here. It's, it's unhinged, but that's because it is a sort of mania that's mm. going on. And the difficulty is, is that the more this happens, the more you're just going to have a real problem where the kind of cultural industries full stop stand because they're just acting as sort of unofficial censors. It's not coordinated, of course. There's not anyone kind of drawing up this list of problematic books or authors or whatever, but in uh, action, that's kind of what's happening. You know, the publishing houses and their sensitivity readers, yeah. which we've talked about, all kinds of literary scandals that have been taking place. Um, you know, through to some of the theatres as well, you know, getting rid of Terry Gilliam or whatever it has. They're so monocultural and they're so uh, gripped by this kind of hysteria that they're just acting and in, in effect, this will just severely limit what is available to read and right. see and all yeah. the rest of it without anyone having to, you know, issue an edict or pass a law or whatever. And that's the really difficult thing to deal with. How do you challenge something like that? Yeah, I mean, Charlie, that's the, that's the key problem in the future, isn't it? It's, it's that we're not even going to see books that might possibly be cancelled yeah, because no, they'll right. just be struck out mm. before they even reach publication. There'll be no need for this kind of rapid reverse pulping mm. if nothing worth pulping is is published. And what, what's interesting as well about um, the kind of people calling for this stuff to mm -hmm. be destroyed, generally white people, <laughs> first yeah. and foremost. And, and, if, and if they are from minority communities, my, my friend Chris has this, this egg roll theory, which is like people who are um, of a certain minority background who rail against their culture being denigrated or dismissed in the media will often have very few links to that culture in person. They often don't speak the language. 
they live like Westerners or they mm-hmm. just, you know, they live in, a, in the, in the kind of the culture that they are grown up in. Yeah. And so you find this kind of fake, fake attempt to recreate a heritage that you never really had through dismissing anyone who tries to enjoy it. How dare you cook noodles like that? Mm. How dare you speak like that? How dare you mm. wear that hat? Yeah. How dare you write that book <laughs> <laughs> or describe those eyes? And this whole thing needs to be um, taken on very strongly. There's a bit of bravery from some publishing these days. Uh, there's not a lot of variety in publishing in, in terms of um, content and description. You know, yeah. there are five topics which we can write about these days. <laughs> um, but it'd be nice if even within those five topics, we had people who were just let alone and, and, and free to write. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spike's other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.